Thirdly, I'd like to thank my sister, Janet, for... Is it right? Okay. The inside thing, you had to be here last night. <laughs> thank you so much for um, your prayers and for this invitation. I really believe, I was thinking this morning, as I was praying, like 6 o'clock this morning, like, man, Lord, I really needed this weekend. So thank you. Uh, to God be the glory. He has truly orchestrated everything. And um, we're going to pray. And uh, we're talking about mentorship this morning. Now, a mentor is not a therapist. A mentor is a trusted advisor. Every single person needs one of those. It is critical, okay? We're going to pray. I just want to make sure everything is working here on this. This uh, enlightenment. All right, everything is working. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to give you all a few moments to pray, a few seconds. This is my custom uh, because the Holy Ghost is chasing after someone this morning. And the Holy Ghost is specifically coming after a sin in your life or my life. Because sin killed Jesus. I was at a conference. I've spoken at so many youth conferences. I've lost track. I really love speaking to young people because you can keep it real with them. You keep it real with older folk, they call the conference on you. But not young people. That's how it is. And so I was preaching at this youth conference a year and a half ago. Preaching Saturday night, the Holy Ghost came down. And as I was speaking, giving my appeal, the Holy Ghost grabbed my attention, and I said to all these young people, there is someone in this building, you're having sex and you're not married. And I said said to them, I am not guessing. The Holy Ghost just told me just now, there is someone in this place, you are fornicating and you're not married. See, the Holy Ghost will chase after that specific sin. I didn't know who it was. After the message, everyone left the tent. One young girl was sitting in the first, the first row of seats right there. She said, Pastor Alvin, can I talk to you? She said, that person you're describing was me. That was Saturday night. She told me I had sex with my boyfriend the day before. That was Friday. In tears. The Holy Ghost is not playing this morning. I promise you, as God is my witness, the Holy Ghost is going to change someone this morning. We're going to pray for the Holy Spirit. That is the prayer you're going to pray within your heart. And when we pray for the Holy Ghost, you must believe that the Holy Ghost is in you. I know Adventists who do, I was mentioning last night, you ask them, hey, is the Holy Ghost residing in your body? Literally, I don't know. We got to stop this nonsense, brothers and sisters. If the Bible says our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, we must believe that. We must believe it. So we're going to pray. I'm going to give you all a few seconds. And then I'm going to pray. We're praying for the Holy Spirit, number one. Number two, we're praying for conviction of sin and a love for righteousness. Because sin killed Jesus. The problem is we love sin too much. Somebody's going to be changed this morning. I'm telling you. And you're going to pray for me as I communicate the message. Let's pray. In the name of Jesus. Father, I come to you knowing that the Holy Ghost has a hold on me right now. I pray as my brothers and sisters are praying within their hearts for the Holy Spirit that they will believe that the Holy Ghost is in them literally. Because the Holy Ghost convicts us of sin and gives us a love for righteousness and sin is the only problem on planet earth. The only problem. It's not AIDS or cancer. Those are symptoms of sin. 
Lord, have your way. I already know you're going to speak. I already know it. Because the Holy Ghost is in me. And that is not arrogance. That is believing what the Bible teaches. Have your way. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Last night was PG-13. Today we're going to keep it PG. Is that all right? You know, uh, statistics tells us that uh, by the age of 15, what age did I say? 70% of the young people by that age have already made it up in their minds that they will leave the church. 70%, that is 7 out of 10. And we need to, because people say, well, we need more young people in the church. Now, that's true. But think about that statement. What we really need is we need young people in Christ. Because when you are in Christ, you will remain in the body. Why? Because Christ is the head of the body. And when we're in Christ or have a relationship with him, we are not leaving Christ no matter what transpires. And some people, not just young people, but old people or older people as well, and they, they give these lame excuses. Well, I don't go to church any longer. I don't go to that church. I'll just stay home and watch 3ABN. I don't go there because there are too many hypocrites in the church. They're hypocrites at Walmart, but you still go to Walmart. I mean, that's such a lame excuse. I'm not even trying to be funny. People give these sorry excuses. You have Jesus, you have everything. Yes, there are hypocrites in the church. I was at a church once. I preached at the church. Preached my heart out. Never forget it. A few weeks later, I'm at the park. The park is right down the street from my house. I'm at the park, and to my chagrin, I notice a couple of people. I'm looking. I kid you not. When they saw me, this is what they did. Let's say this is a, well, let's say this pulpit here is a tree, okay? This pulpit is a tree. We're in the park. And I'm looking, and they look at me, and they do like this. <laughs> I'm not making this stuff up, I promise you. I'm not making this stuff for illustration. And they're behind the tree, literally, and they're peeking out. You know who it was? It was the pastor's wife and the head elder of that church. Brothers and sisters, yes, they're hypocrites in the church. But that is a lame excuse not to come to the body of Christ. We need one another, brothers and sisters, and there is sin in here. Not just that, that pastor, well, the pastor's wife and the head elder. There is sin in here, and God is chasing it because of love. Because of love. It's all about love with Jesus. So what we're going to do, we're just going to look at the, uh, the Bible, and we're going to see some things in here that I really like. We're going to keep it very simple, elementary level, because I have a daughter, and I want my daughter to understand what the Bible teaches. Very elementary. You want to go deeper? Do not miss 3 o'clock today. You, that presentation Pastor Meyer is going to present, do not miss that. But this morning, we'll take it to elementary level. Is that all right? Only two people say, okay, I'm going to do it anyway. Amen. <laughs> now, we're going to discuss this morning what happens when the church is not a safe place. What happens when there is a lack of love for one another amongst the brethren? Because the young adults are annoyed by the teenagers. And the teenagers are annoyed sometimes by the young adults. And then you have the baby boomers, they think the millennials, they're all lazy. And then you have the millennials, they think the baby boomers are antiquated and outdated, and they don't get it. And this is happening in the remnant church. And we're all waiting for the second coming, holding hands, singing kumbaya. No, 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 brothers and sisters. We need to be on one accord. So we're going to look at this in the life of a man named Judas. This brother had some issues, and he was part of a church. What happens when his church did not show him any love or concern? 
we're going to look at, okay? Very simple. Let's turn to John chapter 13. Let's go to John chapter 13. John chapter, every single person has to have a Bible. Every single person. Have, please have a Bible in hand. You know, sometimes I'm preaching and people, they're just looking at me. <laughs> like, man, I'm not that handsome. Now get a Bible. <laughs> Everybody has to have a Bible. And I also want to ask, uh, please make sure that your cell phones are on silent. Is that all right? Please make sure that your cell phones are on silent so we are not distracted. Because the Holy Ghost is going to speak. I already know it. John chapter 13. Are you there, family? Yes. Now, now, listen to the text. The Bible says in John chapter 13, let's go to verse 2. The Bible says in verse 2, And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God, he riseth up from supper and laid aside his garments, and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Pause. The Bible says they're having communion and the ordinance of humility is taking place. And Ellen White tells us that Judas, he pushed his way in and Jesus served Judas first. The Bible says Jesus knew that Judas was going to betray him, but Jesus has so much love in him. Jesus gets down. He takes his towel. He has that basin of water. And he washes the feet of Judas, knowing that a demon has already convinced him to betray Christ. And he's washing his feet. And at the same time, as he's washing the feet of Judas, Jesus is praying for his soul. Because at that moment, when he was washing Judas' feet, his probation was not yet closed. And he's praying, and he's washing, and he's praying. Question, did Judas love Jesus? Listen to what she says here. I love it. She says, talking about Judas, he loved the great teacher and desired to be with him. He felt a desire to be changed in character and life. And he hoped to experience this through connecting himself with Jesus. He really loved Jesus. But you know what she goes on to say? He did not come to a point of fully surrendering himself to Christ. He loved him. How many of you here love Jesus? Only four people love Jesus in here? If you love Jesus, shout amen. 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 That's why we're here. We love Jesus, but with loving Jesus comes some struggles. Judas loved Jesus, and he had some issues, and he needed help. And Jesus is there, and he washes this man's feet. And listen to what the text goes on to say in verse, hmm, let's skip down to verse, let's go to verse 10. Verse 10 says, Jesus said to him, he that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him. Therefore said he, ye are not all clean. Wow. The Bible says Jesus knew exactly what would transpire. And he says, you know what? One of you are here. One of you here. I washed your feet, but you are still unclean. When Jesus utters these words, he is coming after the heart of Judas. He is chasing him because of love. Verse 21. Let's skip to verse 21. Listen to what the text says. Phenomenal. They're at this table, and the Bible says in verse 21, When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall, what everybody? Jesus is sitting down there at the table. And you have these 12 guys around the table. And he tells them, one of you here, you will betray me. Would you want to hang around with someone who's going to betray you? Have you ever been betrayed by someone? Is it a good feeling, yes or no? 
No. But Jesus is still there because he loves them so much. He says, hey, someone here is going to betray me. And you know what Matthew's account says? It's not in this one here in John. But listen to what it says in Matthew's account. The Bible says, and they were exceeding sorrowful and began every one of them to say unto him. Now listen to what they say. They say, Lord, is it I? You know why that is significant? Listen to me real good. You know why that statement by the disciples are significant? Because every single one of those disciples had issues. You're not hearing what I'm saying. Not one disciple, there was not one disciple who pointed the finger to Judas and said, I know it's him. They looked at themselves and they said, Lord, I'm capable of anything. Lord, is it me? And we must understand that every single person in the building is a complete mess without Jesus. You don't like that. Let me talk to the young people. Young people, you see these, I'll just say older. See these senior citizens? Every senior citizen in here is completely messed up without Jesus. Now, some of the seniors, they don't like that. I'll say amen for you. Amen! Amen! You know, I, can we keep this thing 100 this morning? Sometimes, like we had this little skit up earlier, sometimes the older generation, they condemn the younger generation for the same sins they used to do when they were younger. But because they, they're too old to shake their hips, they condemn them. Are you kidding? They can't go to the club anymore, but they'll condemn the young person that still goes. I was at church talking about... Because it gets on my last. I'm trying to stay calm. I know I will not be invited again, but I'm starting to stay calm. You don't know me. I'm a visitor here. I will not be invited. I guarantee it, but I will preach this thing. I was at the church, and this lady, senior citizen in her 70s, comes to me, and she's like, you know what? I was on the brink of committing adultery. On the brink. I was going to fool around with this married man. I was this close. I'm thinking, what? You're in your 70s and you're still hot? You still, what you trying to do? Take care of the grandkids and stay home. You're a grandma, I'm not lying. That's why, hey, look, man, this thing is so real. I used to think, young people, I used to think all elderly people were ready for translation until I became a pastor. Now, I'm, I'm dead serious. I'm not even joking because you got those mothers and fathers of the church. Oh, they're so spiritual. Okay. Brothers. I'm not even trying to be funny. From the youngest to the oldest person in here, we need Jesus. Amen. We need Christ desperately. We're in trouble because without Jesus, we're not going to make it. And here we have Judas, he is struggling with an issue, and he could not go to one disciple because that church was not safe. You know how I know? You remember when James and John, the sons of thunder, went to Jesus with their mama in Matthew chapter 20? The mama gave him some false worship. (laughs) Jesus says, no, what, what do you need? She said, hey, Jesus, grant my request that one of my sons will be on the right side of your kingdom and on the left side. They wanted high position. In Mark's account, when the other ten disciples heard what James and John did with their mama, every single one of them were angry. The other ten were angry at James and John because they got to Jesus first, and they all wanted high position. And since that church that Judas was a member of, they all were full of pride, and they wanted high position, Judas could never go to John and say, hey, man, hey, John, man, I'm I'm struggling, bro. John, I carry the money bag. You know that's my position. And I'm struggling because the money that's in there, sometimes I take some out and I put it in my pocket. John, I'm struggling. You know what John would have done? Okay. He would have listened. All of them would have told Jesus. Hey, Jesus, this guy Judas, he's struggling with some taking money. And I don't think he should be part of the disciples any longer. They would have told on him because that's one less person. They'll be closer to high position. 
And Judas could never, ever go to them because the church is not a safe place during that time and in 2020. You're not hearing what I'm saying. Who are the members here of this church? Raise your hand. You're a member of this church. Raise your hand. Keep them up. Okay? Keep them up. I want to ask the members of this church a question. Is this church a safe place? You see that? Somebody says yes, somebody says no. You know why? You know why? Maybe it's not. Because every member should have said yes. I have two churches, and when I, when I was preaching before, was my member's right here, he'll tell you. I was preaching at one of my churches, and I told him, I said, this church is not safe. That's what I told him as their pastor. I have two churches, not one of them are safe because people talk too much. I have learned in church people gossip more than pray. That's what they do because when we talk about other people, we feel a little better. That's why the Bible says those who compare themselves to others, they're not wise. And we gossip. And then what we do, we label people based on their sins. Hey, don't you know, girl, child, that's that young lady that got pregnant before she got married. Her name is Michelle. Call her Michelle. Don't label people because of their sins. Hey, don't you know he was in prison? He was in prison. He got released, and he's, now he's coming to our, uh, to our church. You better be careful, girl. <laughs> Sick and tired of it. If we understood, do you understand how bad you are? You don't like that. Do you understand how bad I am without Jesus? Because some of us in this building, we think we're above certain sins. Do you know that you are capable of murdering somebody? You don't believe that. David, the Bible says he was a man after God's own heart. If I were to meet David when he was a shepherd boy and say, hey, David, you know what? You're going to be in prominence. You're going to be a king one day. And you know what you're going to do? You're going to fornicate. You're going to get this woman pregnant, have one night stand, and then you're going to kill her husband to cover your sin. That's what you're going to do, David. You're going to murder someone. David would reply, I'm a man after God's own heart. Because without the Holy Ghost, you are not above any sin. Not above, I'm not above anything. I was preaching at my church once, and I said, man, if you get me on the wrong side, I might cuss you out. This church member said, what? Is that just what she said? What? Can you, I, I can't say what I will never do. I can't do that. But this church, my, I don't know about this church. I just know my church is not safe. And that is why in the body of Christ, you have people literally who will come to church Sabbath after Sabbath, and they will suffer in silence. Well, well Pastor, I was molested when I was seven. I was molested. And now I'm homosexual, but I can't tell anyone. You will suffer in silence. Hey, pastor, pastor, man, I'm struggling with this pornography addiction. I come to Sabbath school. I come to Mountain View, and I'm struggling, but I can't tell anyone. I just can't tell anyone at Mountain View because everybody at Mountain View, they're ready for translation. Everyone is holy. I'm the only one struggling. I'm the only messed up one, and you will suffer. In silence. Why? It's not a safe place. We condemn people. Judge them. Brothers and sisters, <laughs> what's happened amongst us? We need Jesus. Verse 22. Let's go to verse 22. I got to calm down here. I love it. I'm telling you, you don't understand how much I love this Bible. <laughs> I just love it. It is so dramatic. Go to verse 22. Are you there? The Bible says in verse 22, Then the disciples looked one on another, doubting of whom he spake. They didn't know it was Judas. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. That's John. Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be of whom he spake. He then lying on Jesus' breast said unto him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now watch. Pause. 
Is that a clear sign, yes or no? Oh, only five people answering me. We just re- Is that a clear sign, yes or no? Yes. That's like me saying someone in this church is going to punch me out after the sermon. <laughs> and somebody in here says, well, who? I will say the person I give this clicker to is going to punch me out. And I go over here. I love my brother's shoe. I love my brother's shoe. But if I gave him the clicker, you tell me, who is the one who's going to punch me out? Him. That is a clear sign. Jesus, he says, one of you going to betray me? They said, Lord, is it, my, who, is it me? Is it me? Is it, am I the one? Peter beckons John. He said, hey, John, John, ask Jesus who it is. Because John is next to his breast. John says, hey, Jesus, please tell me who is going to betray you. Jesus, <laughs> elementary level stuff. Hey, is going to be the one I give this piece of bread to. I'm going to dip this bread, and then I'm going to give it to the betrayer, okay? Clear. Dips the bread, give it to Judas. Not one of them catches it. Not one of them. Not one of them catch it. You know why? It's the reason why. Look what the Bible goes on to say. Not one of them get it. The Bible goes on to say, go to verse 27. Watch the drama. Verse 27 says, I love it. And after the sop, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, that thou doest, do quickly. Now no man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto him. Now watch the drama. Watch. For some of them thought, because Judas had the bag that Jesus had said unto him, buy those things that we have need of against the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. They did not get it. Now watch verse 30. Don't miss verse 30. He then, having received the sop or the piece of bread, went immediately out. And it was a night. Wow. Do you understand how powerful that what we just read? It's not powerful. It's very, very sad. Do you know how sad that is? Listen to what Jesus does, brothers and sisters. This is critical. Listen to what Jesus does. Jesus tells his disciples sitting there, Someone here is going to betray me. He takes the piece of bread. He gives a clear signal. It's Judas. Judas gets up from the table. The Bible says Satan is now in him. Judas gets up. He leaves the room, the Bible says, and it was night. Okay, let me help you out. He leaves, and not one member in his church ran after him. Do you hear what I just said? Not one member, and Jesus just told those members of his church, someone in here is going to betray me today. He leaves. You know what they should have done? John or John or Peter, Peter's always talking. Peter should have been like, hey, bro, wait. Wait. Not one. You know, you know why? Listen, listen. Do you know those disciples? Man, they didn't love Judas. Come on, brothers and sisters. You remember what they were talking about at that Passover table? Who will be the greatest? At communion, they were fussing about position in the church. That's God's church. Jesus is literally their pastor. And they're at the table. Oh, I want to be first. I want to be the GC president. I want to get out of it. They are arguing. When you argue like that and you want to be above your brother or your sister, there's no love there because love does not do that. And because that church was not safe for Judas, he loved Jesus. We saw that. That church was not safe for Judas. Number one. Number two, they did not love him. Because they did not love him and they only cared about themselves. Listen to what Jesus has to say in verse 34. In the context, listen to Jesus in verse 34. Watch this. Powerful. Listen to Jesus in verse 34. Are you there? 
He says, a new commandment, this is after Judas is gone, a new commandment I give unto you that you, what everybody? Love one another as I have what? Loved you that ye also what? Love one another. Now watch verse 35. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if you have what everybody? What? Come on, brothers and sisters. Jesus has to teach the disciples about love because the context teaches us they did not care about that disciple. Jesus saying, look, guys, you let one go. You let a church member go when I gave you a sign. Jesus says, you don't love him. You didn't love him. You only cared about yourself and your position. You didn't love him. Let me smile. This stuff works me up because I see this foolishness in the body of Christ. People don't love each other. Church is not about you. It's about us. We are a community, brothers and sisters. And the sad reality, there are some people who don't like people in the same church. Let me tell you a story. Is that all right? I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> all right, Tyrell, I'm going to do it. Give me some, bro. I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, hey, check it out, right? Keeping it real. Talking about love missing in a church. My brother, I have a twin brother. We were talking about that last night. And my twin brother, he, um, he went to Southern Adventist University. Anybody here a graduate of Southern? Anybody here? All right, Joanna, anybody else? Okay, my brother in the back. You? Do you have your hand up? Oh, okay. <laughs> but he went to Southern. And you know, Southern is in the South. <laughs> and I'm like, duh. <laughs> That's no new information, right? Sure. <laughs> and so my brother, he has a practicum, right? Now check it out. Let's say I'm, I'm my brother, right? And I have the Bible. My brother, because you have to preach as a, as a student at a church. My brother is ready. They asked him to come preach at this church, a little small church there in southern in Tennessee. And my brother goes to the church, pumped up, pumped up, excited, has his Bible in hand. The Bible is excited to preach the gospel to these Adventists. Opens that door. He told me he was at the door of the church. And an elder came up to him. Elder came up. Just what my brother told me. He said, you know what, sir? The board voted, and you cannot preach here this Saturday. He said, the board voted. That means the board is a representation of the church, the governing body. My brother said to him, straight up, it was a white gentleman. He said to him, did the board vote that because I'm black? The elder said, yes. You would think. This is not during the time of Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and the, the bus boycott. No, this is in 2003. In 2003, you are still segregated. Black people still can't preach in the remnant church. And we're all going to heaven. No, you're not. Not with that foolishness. No, you are not. And I'm passionate about it because, look, if you're white and I'm black, we all bleed red. Amen. How in the world is racism still in the church? I know black people who don't like white people, Adventists. I know Hispanics who don't like black Adventists. I know white Adventists who don't like black Adventists or other minorities, but we're all going to meet Jesus. We're on the welcome table. Get out of here. Are you sick? Are you sick? The remnant church can't even be safe. The remnant church. We got the truth. Man, keep quiet if you're racist. We got Ellen White. Keep quiet. Foolishness. And we all love Jesus. I never met an Adventist who did not love Jesus. We all love Jesus, but I'm racist. I will talk about it. 
because I'm sick of it. Come on now, I'm tired of it. Makes no sense. Color of your skin, you can't even preach. Let me smile. Because I have to calm myself down. Because this stuff works me up. Because for me, it doesn't matter who you are. I come from a mixed background, Indian, Jamaican. My wife is Filipino. I see people. I see people. Do you love each other at this church? Do you really love each other here? Hmm. And then in churches, we have cliques. Okay, thanks. In my church? I was like, you tell you know you were there, Tyrell, when I was preaching at church. At my church, I literally had to preach a subject on being nice to people. You were there. Every single Saturday, I know who is going to sit with who at the potluck. This group will be here. This group is going to be here. This group is going to be right over here. This group will not talk to this group. There are people at my church who have been going to that church for oh, for decades, and they still don't know some of the people's names. I'm not making this up. I'm not making this. And we're all going to heaven. Man, this is stuff. And then when guests come, the guests are just sitting there by themselves. No one's talking. I got to talk to everybody. That's who I am. That's my personality. I got to do it. The rest of the believers, they're with their little clique here. They're with their little group. Why well, the church is not safe. I need to move. I could go on forever. Oh. Now, let me, just, let me just get this thing practical. I just got to move. <laughs> Let's get practical. So practical solutions, okay? Because we need help. We need help. Number one, the youth need a young adult to guide them. That's what they need, guidance. And again, it's not a therapist. It's a, it's a guide. Like, for example, if you're a young person, a teenager, I met some nice teenagers at uh, Pastor Meyer's house last night. Really nice teenagers, uh, Daniela, Genesis, and Julia. And Art, I got all four right. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I'm struggling a little bit, but I got it. I met these four teenagers. That's awesome. These teenagers need guidance. Not just them, every teenager. And a mentor is one who says, you know what? If I come to a, go to a mentor and I say, as a teenager and I say, you know what? I'm going on my first date. Should I kiss on my first date? What should I do? You know, should I pay for the food or should we go Dutch? <laughs> I mean, what should I do? I want to be a gentleman. And hopefully my mentor would say, you know what, Alvin? Learn from me. I made some mistakes. You know, kissing is not really good because it will lead to other things. And yes, you pay for that day. You pay for that meal. Chivalry is not dead. Be a gentleman. Open the door. Come on, ladies. Open the door. Man, man these ladies quiet, man. Come on. And there you go. Yeah, snap those fingers. Yes. Open that door for the sisters. Amen. Come on, they're queens. Yes. That is what an advisor does. Guides them. Leads them, okay? Number two, young adults need, need to find an adult and receive counseling about marriage, prep, um, pre marriage preparation and financial stability, et cetera, et cetera. And mentors must be of the same gender, yeah, right. uh, for obvious reasons. <laughs> same gender, okay? Uh, number three, if, you don't, if this church is not safe, you might have to go to a Sunday church for Celebrate Recovery. That's, that's a shame. Mercy. You ever been to Celebrate Recovery? I was preaching once. Just uh, a few weeks ago at um, Shoes Church, I did a week of um, prayer there, had a good time. And I'm preaching, 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 preaching about sexual immorality. And I said to them, hey, if you want me to go with you to an essay class, Sex Anonymous, if you want me to go with you, I will go with you. That's what I told them. I tell my church the same thing. I, t I am available. I will go. I don't care who sees me. President Connell can see me going to that meeting. I will still Go. I will go with my brother. And I, I made that appeal there at that church, at the Hmong church, and I got a text message. And this person said, I want you to come with me. 
Somebody was listening. But if the problem was, though, it was a female. And she was really sincere. She was really sincere. And I texted her back and I said, I am so sorry. I can't do that because it will not look uh, appropriate. And she understood that. I said, you know what, seek one of your sisters in, in Christ and go with her. Now, we are in this thing together, brothers and sisters. We are in this thing together. And so you might have to go. I've been to one of these things. As Sex Anonymous, I've been to one to help a brother out. I will go with you. Come on. Why? No, we're brothers and sisters here. No one is not better than the next. I'm not better than you because I'm a pastor. I told you if you get me on the bad side. <laughs> I already told you that. I'm not better than you. I need Jesus. Amen. So you might need Celebrate Recovery, uh, number five, uh, or go to Christian counseling. You might need counseling from a Christian or your pastor. Uh, number six, um, men's and women's small groups, okay? Small groups, that's very good. If it is a safe place, okay, it has to be a safe place. Number six, finally, you need an accountability partner. You might need an accountability partner, okay? <clears throat> it's amazing. As a pastor, what people tell me, you would not believe. There is nothing that you can tell me that will ever shock me. Nothing. I've, I've heard so much. And what I've learned as a minister, I'm not making this stuff up. This is just my experience. The main problems in the Adventist church is sexual immorality. It's like, that's like 99% of the time. So you might need an accountability partner. And you know what? As the under-shepherd of my church, I believe, you know, I want to be an example to my church of a safe place. So I like being transparent. You know what I did? Tyrell was there. I think you were there. My wife, right? How many of you here are happily married? Can you say amen? amen. Was that everybody? <laughs> uh, amen, right? Happily married. But, you know, in marriage, do you have some ups and downs? Right? Sometimes your husband can get on your last nerves. Come on, sis, you're the only one to say amen. Amen. That's truthful. Sometimes your wife can get on your last nerves. Come on, man. I love it. I love it. Yes. We can get on each other's nerves because both of us have a sinful nature. And I remember one Sabbath, man, I'm getting ready to preach. I got my suit on. And then my wife and I got into a little uh, scuffle. Not, not, not blows or anything, but... We got into like some verbal stuff. And she was mad. And I was mad. And so, man, I'm sitting down. You know how that special music is being sung? I'm sitting down waiting to get up to preach the word of God. And there is tension between my wife and I. I get up. And I stand up here. I was like, man, I can't do this. What I did, because I believe in transparency. I said, Joanna, come on the stage. My wife, in front of all those people in the congregation, came up on the stage. And before my entire church congregation, I said, you know, I just want to apologize to my wife because I cannot preach like this. There's something between us. I can't do it. And then my wife, she had like a little tear or something. And then, <laughs> and then she, she, like, she hugged me. And did we kiss on the cheek or something like that? But she hugged me, and then I think we did kiss on the and whatever. Anyway, she patted me on the back, and she sat down. But the point is, after that, this girl who was married, she's my age, around 42, and she said to me, she said, Pastor, that demonstration had me in tears. She said, I've never, ever seen a pastor do that in my entire life. So she's never seen that. She says, she said, I thought that my marriage was the only one, you know, I thought all pastors had perfect marriages. I'm like, no, no, there's no such thing as perfection after the fall of man. Have a good marriage. We have a great marriage. And you know what we do? I was telling the church this as well, because you got to model. 
I want my church to be transparent. I, I, you know, you know, I say it a number of times at my church. I want this church to be a safe place. Do you know the church should be the safest place on earth? And so I was telling my church family, you know what? My wife and I, sometimes we would get in like arguments, and you know who it affects the most is the child. And I told the church, we had to apologize to our daughter a number of times. Literally sit her down and say, you know, Mela, you know, your mom, your dad, we're sorry. You know how powerful those words are? Some parents believe they're above apologizing to their kids. If, a, if some parents can just say to their kids, I am so sorry. You know how much hurt will just go away? Because those words are so powerful. I remember I was preaching that point at, at the Asian church. I was preaching that. And the man about apologizing to your kids, his man was sitting down. He jumped up. He said, preach it! Because he could relate. Because his family was broken. If parents could just apologize. She'll, my daughter's right there. She'll tell you. Why? Because I want my church to be a safe place. I want to be safe to tell my church certain things and be transparent. And the good news is, no one judges me. They don't talk bad about me. That, that, that's good news. Amen. I, I mean, I, I'm a family man. I'm a real big on family, my church knows, because I never had a father growing up. So I'm really, really big on that. Because you know what happens? Let's wrap this thing up. Because you know what happens if you do not seek help? If you don't seek help and do things that are practical, let me show you what happened to Judas. Because his church was not safe. And the white tells us, later that same day on the road from Pilate's Hall to Calvary, there came an interruption to the shouts and jeers of the wicked throng who were leading Jesus to the place of crucifixion. Here's the picture. Everybody focus here. Jesus has the cross about to die so that all of us can be saved. He's going to Calvary and the Bible, and she says here that there are shouts and jeers and they're crying out, kill him, crucify Kill that imposter, and they're yelling, and they're shouting, and they're loud, and they're going back and forth. But in the midst of all the shouting, it says there was an interruption. In other words, there was a shh. There was something that hushed the entire crowd. Wonder what could that be? As they passed a retired spot, they saw at the foot of the lifeless tree the body of Judas. Goes on to say, it was a most revolting sight. His weight had broken the cord by which he had hanged himself to the tree. In falling, his body had been horribly mangled, and dogs were now devouring it. This brother had nowhere to go not even in his church. And someone might be thinking, well, that theology is not really accurate. Why didn't Jesus chase after Judas? Jesus was chasing Judas for over three years. And he just washed his feet and praying. He chased him for over three and a half years. Do you know there are people who are suicidal in the remnant church? There's this guy who used to go to our church, you know, showed me those cuts on his arms. Suicidal, to talk to me about that stuff all the time. You pray with him all the time. He would hang out with the young adults at my church who would support him. Suicidal. He tried to commit suicide three times. Three times. You know why people do that? You know why people have suicidal thoughts? Listen to me very, very carefully because somebody in here might be struggling. Because of what has transpired in the past, the molestation, the rape, the incest, because of what has happened in the past, all of these memories, and there's pain there, and there's hurt there, and there is anger and bitterness and resentment. And because of what happened in the past, they'll say, you know what, I'm going to just end it all. 
No one cares. You know what happens when someone commits suicide? You're not killing your past. You're killing your future. Because God has a plan for you. And he has a future for you. He wants to use you for his glory. Do you know how much potential you have? I don't care how people have spoke down upon you. I don't care the bullying. You are so valued to God. You are somebody. Killed himself. Can you imagine how Jesus felt when he saw Judas? Man, I worked three and a half years. Judas, this cross on my back was also for you. Can you imagine how the disciples reacted? Because John was at the cross. That means John was in that crowd. Can you imagine John going to Peter? I like using my imagination when I'm in the Bible. John going to Peter, hey, hey, Peter. Now you won't believe it, man. Did you hear what happened to Judas? No, no, what happened? He took off a few hours ago. It was nighttime, but, but I don't know what happened. What happened to him? I saw his body was being eaten by dogs. What? What? No, Judas! He killed himself. Hey, hey Thomas, Thomas, did you hear, man? Did you hear what happened to Judas? No, oh, man, man, why are you, why are you so, what, what, what's going on, what's going on, why are you panicking, what's going on? He killed himself. What? He was one of us. And maybe they reflected. When he left, not one of us went after him. When he left, none of us cared. When he left, no one wanted to bring him back. And now he's dead? And the church is not a safe place. You might not commit literal suicide, but you are dying a slow death on the inside. You should be able to have someone in church you trust. You know why? Because it's biblical. It's biblical. Mentorship in the Bible. A few more slides and we're going to pray. We have mentorship in the Bible. Joshua was mentored by Moses. Samuel was mentored by Eli. Ruth had Naomi. Elisha had Elijah. The disciples had Jesus. Timothy had Paul. During the Reformation, Melanchthon had Martin Luther. And Ellen White had Joseph Bates. Who do you have? Who do you have? Who do you have? I have someone I praise God. I have someone, my Bible's closed, we're done. I have someone in my life I can tell absolutely anything to, anything. You know why? Because there's no judgment there. I've told him some things, I'm like, man, why did I tell him that? Because he is safe. People have told me things, I kid you not. I think the reason why people tell me things is because I, I say all the time, if you tell me something, it's going to be between me, you, and God. I don't tell my wife anything. So that's not safe. Well, you know, I'm not saying that. But you understand, I'm not saying that. You guys are too much, man. You guys are too much. I got to drink some water on that one. But you know what I mean. And so you have to have... A safe place, okay? Because at the end of the day, it's all about Calvary. Jesus died, brothers and sisters, so that we can be saved. And you know what is so awesome about Calvary? This is so powerful. Sometimes we take this stuff for granted. Oh, yeah, I've been hearing about the death of Jesus since I was in cradle roll. Brothers and sisters, a man died so that you don't taste the second death. He died for you. You know why this is so critical? I promise you, next slide is the last. Last slide. 
Somebody should have said, take your time. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> That's all right. Next time. <laughs> Last slide. I, wanted, I just want to show you how powerful Calvary is. After this event, listen to me very carefully. Jesus resurrected. He went to his father. His father approved the sacrifice. Jesus came back down to earth, to earth according to Acts chapter 1, and he was seen for 40 days. The Bible tells us that they were in the upper room, 120 folk in that room, and now they're on one accord. They're in that room, and they have one purpose, and that is to seek the face of God. No longer is a position and status, but to seek the face of God. And they're praying, they're praying, they're praying for 10 days. In Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost drops. Penta, the 50th day. So 10 days they were praying. And you know what happened? Listen to this verse. And then I'm going to make my appeal. Listen to this verse. Absolutely powerful because Calvary makes the difference. The Bible says, Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had a need. We say amen, and that's good. I say amen, but do we understand the depth of that quote? No, no, I don't know. Let me, let me. <clears throat> you know what this is saying here? The early church after Calvary. They said, you know what, after the Holy Ghost came, what do you need, brother? Your, your child is struggling. I mean, you're struggling to pay the tuition at the academy. You know what I'm going to do? I got this fancy watch here. I don't even really use it that much. I'm going to pawn this watch, brother. I'm going to sell it, and every single cent I have, I'm going to give it to you to pay your tuition. Amen. Hey, you're struggling. You're a single mom. You're struggling with the mortgage. Look, I got some possession. I got some clothes. I don't even wear these clothes. They've been in a closet for years. I don't even wear them. What I'm going to do, I'm going to sell these clothes on eBay. Every single cent I get from the proceeds, I'm going to give it to you. Now, you're a single mom. I want to help you with your mortgage. If this church functioned like the early church did, <laughs> we would have to have four services on the Sabbath. I'm not even joking. You know how much love that is? To sell what you have for someone else. We're all in this thing together, brothers and sisters. We're all together. They sold their possessions. For the early church, it was all about evangelism and loving each other. We're all believers. It doesn't matter if you're black. It doesn't matter if you're white. It doesn't matter if you're Hispanic, Chinese, Korean. We're all in this thing together. This is what we need in 2020. Hey, young person, young adult, you're struggling. I can help you guide the way. We're in this thing together. Hey, I just got married. I'm a young adult, and I see you're having a hard time with your marriage. Hey, let's go out and hang out together sometime. Let's just chop it up. Let's go to the gym and let's just lift weights. Let's have a good time. Let's go eat somewhere later. Let's just hang out. We're all in this thing together. It's practical stuff. I've done it before a number of times. Man, let's talk over breakfast, bro. Hey, man, I had the same issue. I went through the same thing. Let's pray. Let's pray together. Praying together in restaurants with people. Let's see God's face. Let's pray. I'm with you, man. We're going to go through this thing together. I'm with you. Call me when that struggle comes, that temptation comes. Just call me. Let's pray. Let's pray. No condemnation here. I'm with you. All things in common. All heads bowed and eyes closed. We want to see God's face. We want to pray. We want to make my appeal. Then we're going to pray. I want to be very, 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 very clear and very specific. My first appeal this morning, because we need Jesus. We need to love people. My first appeal is, if you have a sin in your life that you like, it is not a struggle. You like this sin. 
but this sin is killing you. And you say, oh, Lord, God, I, I just can't. I need help. If you have a sin, a cherished, darling sin, and you want victory over that thing, raise your hand. Keep them up. Might see who I'm praying for. Keep your hands up, please. I want to see exactly who I'm praying for. You got to send you light. Very specific. You got to send you light. Keep them up. Keep them up. Hands down. We're praying. We're still praying. My second appeal. There is someone in the body of Christ you really don't like. You really don't have love for this brother or sister. And you're saying, God, I need to love people. We're in the same church. I need to love people. God, give me help to love this brother or this sister who I cannot stand. If you need help loving somebody in the body of Christ, raise your hand. Keep them up. I see what I'm praying for. Keep them up. So I'm praying for it. Holy Ghost is moving. Keep them up. I need help loving people. I need help loving people. Keep them up. Keep them up. I just need help. Keep them up. Keep them up. Keep them up. Keep them up. I want to make sure I get every hand because the Holy Ghost is moving. Keep them up. My hands down. My next appeal, we're praying. We're still praying because the Holy Ghost is moving. You have backslidden. You have strayed from the beautiful Jesus. And he said, oh, Lord, God, I heard the message today, and it pricked my heart. I need to come back to Christ right now. I'm backslidden. Raise your hand. Keep them up. I want to see what I'm praying for. Keep them up. You're backslidden. Very specific. Keep them up. Keep them up. I'm backslidden. Keep them up. Keep them up. I want to make sure I get every hand. I'm backslidden. I'm straight. Keep them up. Hands down. Next appeal, last appeal. Pastor Alvin, I just need help loving Jesus. I have a hard time with my daily devotional life. I think Jesus is angry at me, and that is so against his character. He loves you. Pastor Alvin, I just need help loving Jesus. Hard, man, it's hard. If that is you, you're saying, Lord, I just need help loving Jesus. You want me to pray for you, raise your hand. Keep them up. The struggle is real. Keep them up. 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 Hands down. And we're going to pray. Before I pray, I want to do this. I need every husband in this building to come to this altar. I need every husband to come here and meet me. Every single husband. This is very important. Every single husband to come to this altar. Then we're going to pray for those appeals. This is why I call the men here. Because men, we are leaders of our homes. And I want to consecrate these husbands to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I'll say this, my church, they know this very well. I'll wait till all the men come because I want to address you all personally. This is vital. At my church, I really stress the importance of men leading out in family worship. I'm very big on that. Like I said earlier, I never had a father in my home. And before we pray, I want to just tell you how critical this is. I was at Loma Linda, and I was doing a Bible study with a whole bunch of young adults there, the young people, teenagers, some years ago. I'll never forget it. After the Bible study, I was in the kitchen with five wives, five wives in the kitchen. And you know what they told me, every single one of them? They said, Alvin, the only Thing we want from our husbands is that they have family worship with us. That's it. All five of them wanted that one thing, brothers. 
They didn't want a new car, a new purse. They wanted their husbands to step up and be the priest of their homes. So I'm charging you men of God. I'm charging you because I hear it too much. The men in my church, they're just not having worship. And that is not acceptable. Brothers, and I want to talk to the ladies, you wives, if your husband is struggling and your husband decides he's going to start having family worship tonight until the second coming of Jesus, when you have family worship tonight, encourage your husband. Say, you know what, sweetheart, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. I'm proud. Keep going. Keep going, sweetheart. Just keep going. You're doing a good job as a priest of the home. Keep going. Encourage your husband. We're in this thing together. But, man, it comes down to us. We initiate family worship, not our wives. We do that. Let us pray. Father in heaven, I want to pray for those who raise their hands at the first appeal. Saying, Lord, I have a sin in my life that I like. I like this sin. And Lord, please free them from that bondage. Give them power to be liberated. I want to pray for those who raise their hands at the second appeal. Just being honest, saying, I have hate for someone in the body of Christ. Lord, a lot of hands went up because this is the problem we have in church. We hate people in church. Now, this thing is real because I've been there. And for every single hand that went up, just being honest in the presence of the Holy Ghost, please give them victory. Please, dear God, if they have to approach a brother, if they have to approach a sister and say, you know what, sis, brother, I'm sorry. You did something to me, and I hated you for that. I'm sorry. Forgiveness, huge. God be with them. I pray for those who raise their hands at a third appeal. Just being honest and saying, Lord God, I have strayed from the beautiful Jesus. I have backslidden. Oh, God, I pray. And I'm so grateful that they can come to you at any moment, at any moment, and you will accept them and not cast them away. And for the fourth appeal, I pray for those who raise their hands saying, I just need help loving Jesus. My daily devotionals are not the best. I just need help. And God will help you. And for these brothers who have come forward. These husbands, the priest of the home, this is a high, high calling. People are suffering. I know at my church, I got husbands at my church don't even have family worship consistently. And the wife is frustrated. The kids are frustrated. It's tough. I pray a blessing on every husband here that these husbands will take leading their families in worship dead seriously because they will be held accountable by God. I pray that their wives will encourage them and be that support that we need as husbands. Because God, when you come back, Lord, I pray that none of our kids will be lost. We want our children and families to be saved. I pray for everyone in this building. And Lord, let us not forget the lesson taught this morning. The church was not safe for Judas. And as a result, he committed suicide. God, may we have a mentor and a safe place. And may this church be extremely safe for the people who come. I pray for the young people here. It is so awesome to see all these young people in church. I pray these young people will remain in Christ. You remain in Christ, you're going to remain in the body. Lord, we need conversion. We need to be born again. That is so critical. Give us the power of the Holy Ghost. And Lord, I pray, if I don't see these people again, I pray that at the second coming, we'll meet one another at the edge of the sea of glass. I pray that everyone here will be part of the first resurrection or caught up in the air to meet you because we fell in love with Jesus while living on this planet. We love you so much, and I thank you for the presence of the Holy Ghost during this session. 
because the Holy Ghost convicts hearts, not man. Thank you for leading. And Lord, I just want to thank you personally, Lord God, for not leaving me alone behind this pulpit in spite of myself. Because you know me better than anyone here. And Lord, I love you with all of my heart because you first loved me. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray, let every child of the king say, Amen. 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 God bless you, brothers. God is going to use you in your homes. We're going to make it.